Good evening and welcome to our service. We're going to start by singing Lead Me to Calvary, please. As we sing, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Let me, like Mary, through the gloom, come with a gift to thee. Show to me now the empty tomb, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for Thee. Even Thy cup of grief to share, Thou hast borne all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget Thine agony, Lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Well, good evening to all of you. Hope you're doing well. Hope you've had a great afternoon. Hope the Lord has blessed you. Hope you've had a great weekend as well. Looking forward to uh, a blessed week ahead of us. Thanks for joining us tonight um, for, uh, for worship. Looking forward to Jesse preaching here in just a few minutes. Um, and just so you're aware, you may be able to obviously notice this, but I think last week um, we assumed that uh, when we recorded this service and uh, showed it later, you wouldn't be able to uh, chat with other people live, but you certainly can. And uh, so it's almost just like a live stream to where um, you can chat with people real time, even though the service was recorded prior to. But uh, just wanted to make you aware of that and uh, thankful for that technology for sure. Thankful that you're joining with us uh, this evening. Looking forward to worshiping with you. I want to thank you, of course, for your support. I uh, want to thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you for your encouragement and prayers. And uh, just wanted to let you know um, that uh, our staff has been working real hard looking ahead into the future of what, uh, what the next ministry semester, so to speak, uh, looks like and uh, making some plans for that. We'll, we have a deacons meeting tonight and we'll be talking about it with the deacons as well, hoping to put together a ministry plan uh, for the rest of the semester. Um, that helps take care of God's people, that helps shepherd the people, disciple the church, serve the church. And uh, we need your prayers. We need your wisdom for that. We would really appreciate you praying for us for just clear direction, for God to make the path forward, for what a ministry looks like, a faithful ministry that shepherds God's people in a COVID culture and with a lot of unknowns ahead of us. <clears throat> Uh, what that looks like. And so we, we would definitely covet your prayers for that and look forward to hopefully in the next few weeks begin sharing with you some ministry plans for the fall that I hope encourage you in your faith and reach out to our community. Um, but uh, there's much to be thankful to the Lord for as well. We're thankful for his goodness to us. We're thankful for how uh, the church has been supported. Thank you for your generous generosity with your tithes and offerings. Um, I'm thankful for our staff team who loves the Lord and loves the church and wants to serve uh, serve the church faithfully. Um, really appreciate them. Thankful for you and your encouragement and support uh, all along the way. Um, 
want to mention a few things in prayer, of course, for uh, upcoming ministry plans. We want to pray for our communities. We want to pray for uh, we want to pray for our school systems, our school staffs. With, we have many students in our church going back to school. We have many uh, we have many teachers and administrators that serve in the church and in our community. So we want to be praying for all of them. We want to be praying for God to bring an end to COVID-19. We want to be praying for God to rid us uh, of this illness. Um, we want to be praying for our medical professionals and staff who are in the trenches, our essential workers who are in the trenches every day. Um, and we want to pray for um, resources, uh, medicines and vaccines that can really help for, to be developed. All those things, of course. Um, you know, it's interesting that, of course, uh, early and middle, late spring, there was a lot of uh, intensity and even paranoia and fear. And then as we approached summer, you know, uh, we started to let our guard down. Things started to ease up. And it seems like now, of course, that our guard, we're bringing our guard back up, you know, uh, that uh, there's more uncertainty in front of us, more even greater concerns in front of us. But we want to ask God to reveal to us uh, what he wants to teach us. We also want to not miss what God's teaching us, showing us through this. Um, <clears throat> but we just need to saturate our community, our families, our community leaders uh, in, in prayer for sure. Um, we want to pray for uh, Miss Neva Green, who was in the hospital this week, uh, but back recovering at perfect care. We want to be uh, praying for her. Um, who else do we need to be praying for? Do we need to, is there anybody else that we need to, that we need to remember? All right, well, um, let's pray as we continue in worship, and let's remember this week, uh, let's remember this week, uh, Miss Neva, let's remember those that may be sick from COVID, and sick and recovering, let's remember those that are grieving still, the loss of a loved one. Uh, and let's remember um, our church leaders as we plan and prepare, and um, let's remember all of our all of our community leaders, all of our schools and teachers and staff as well. Lord, as we come to come to you this evening, it's a privilege to worship you again today, to gather with the church family. And Lord, although we are doing this virtually, uh, thank you for united hearts. Thank you for the desire to worship you, to fellowship together, to hear your word, to hear you speak to us. And God, I pray that you would do that. I pray that you would speak to us as we take a few minutes from our Sunday evening. God, I pray that you would meet with us as we worship you, as we sing about you, pray to you, hear your word. I pray that you would speak powerfully to us. I pray for Jesse as he preaches in a minute. You would empower him with your words. Give him a humble confidence in you and your spirit doing the work through your word. We pray for Miss Neva that you bring healing uh, to her body. We would pray for those that are recovering from COVID that you would bring full and complete healing and recovery. Lord, we pray for those that are still grieving the loss of a loved one. Lord, COVID has made grief a little different. So Lord, we, we pray, God, that you would bring comfort and grace and peace. Lord, we pray for Lord, all of our school staff administration, teachers that have returned or will be returning to school. Lord, I pray that you would help them trust you, that you would give them peace and not anxiety as they work in a different environment. I pr we pray for healing. Lord, we pray that you would stop the spread, that you would bring an end to COVID-19. Lord, even though we can't see the future, you can. You are working your will. Lord, we ultimately whether COVID ends soon or not, we surrender to you. Lord, help us not to miss what you're teaching us, what you're showing us. Help us, Lord, not to abandon being the hands and feet of Christ in the community, showing your love and compassion, sharing the good news in a world full of bad news. Lord, we pray for our church that you would give us wisdom as what a faithful ministry schedule looks like for the fall. 
what a faithful ministry shepherding God's people in a COVID culture looks like. Lord, make the path clear for us, I pray. We pray for the church family members that have been largely disconnected from the church body. God, we pray that you would help them. Those that are unable or those for whom <clears throat> it would be unwise to come to a public worship service. Lord, I pray that you would comfort them. Lord, you would bring them grace. Lord, you would encourage them and grow them in their faith. Lord, I pray that we would seek out other ways to have fellowship with them and reach out to them. So, Lord, I pray that you would bring unity and warmth and closeness to our church family, even though that many of us are disconnected. Lord, being disconnected from the church family can bring discouragement, can bring fear, can bring apathy. Lord, can make temptation to sin stronger. So, Lord, I pray that you would work through the ministry and outreach of the church, of the saints, of the preaching and teaching of your word, and your spirit would continue to help us grow in our faith and grow in our fellowship with one another, even in a COVID culture. So I pray that this evening you would bring just some special encouragement to our folks who are largely just confined to their homes and not able to get out in the community or come to the church much. Encourage them, lift them up, I pray. Lord, meet with us as we worship you this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn is I Love to Tell the Story. Is that what? As we sing, I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme and glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seems hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, will be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story, to will be my theme and glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really good to be back here, or really, we didn't never really left, but it's good for y'all to be back to uh, worship together. Um, I know it may be a little weird right now, the fact that this is kind of pre-recorded, but it's kind of premiering. Um, at least it is for me uh, to be doing this, but I'm glad that y'all are able to talk together, that y'all are able to watch um, this service, and that y'all can just interact with one another. In fact, uh, what I want you to go ahead and do is, why not just go ahead and type a highlight of today? What was something that you just really enjoyed doing? Uh, were you able to take a nap today? Were you able to just fix a really good meal? Um, just go ahead and type that in the comments below just to kind of encourage one another. And while you're doing that, I want you to be thinking about 
what really drives you? What do you just really wake up in the morning that you love to do that is one of your passions? Um, it could be working on a car. Do you like to work on cars, fix up uh, vehicles, turn them into just muscle cars or whatever? Or do you like to garden? Do you like to deer hunt? Be thinking about what really drives you. Do you like to study and just catch up on news and see just kind of how the world works? Um, and I want you to kind of do this because I want us to start on a positive note because the text we're going to be in is not exactly known for being positive. So I want you to be encouraged, be uplifted. So we're going to go in Ecclesiastes and just watch as Solomon just tears apart everything. So go ahead and flip to Ecclesiastes. Um, and in case you didn't watch last week, what we're going to be doing is kind of starting a little series going through the book of Ecclesiastes, just seeing what um, it has to say about life, has to say about God, and how this really applies to us. And just to kind of give you a little taste of where what the direction is that we're heading in, this book really kicks off with this really uplifting verse saying, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. So nothing really like saying that everything is as pointless as trying to catch smoke to really give a kick in your uh, step there, to really just pick you up. But tonight I do want us to walk through this. I want us to embrace this fact. I want us to come up close to the paradox that is meaninglessness. And we're going to do that by looking in Ecclesiastes 1, verses 12 through chapter 2, 26. In these verses, there are three sections that uh, Solomon kind of walks us through. It's the section of wisdom, the vanity of wisdom, the vanity or meaninglessness of pleasure, and the vanity of work and saving up riches here. So before we really get started... You have to understand where Solomon is coming from. It's most likely when Solomon wrote this, he was much older, that he was kind of reflecting on life. In fact, in uh, verse 12 of chapter 1, it says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. So this is kind of implying that he was much older, looking back, reflecting on his life. And in each section, uh, he tries to find meaning in the world. He tries to go through and find meaning and wisdom alone, or meaning and pleasure alone, meaning in working alone. And what you'll see is that you just see his brokenness as he comes to the end of each of these things, that they don't really supply or provide you with anything that's fruitful. So... Be aware of this, that he was seeking wisdom alone, self-indulgence alone, work alone. And when you read this, don't assume that's how uh, we should be feeling that life as a Christian is just a killjoy and God wants it to be that way. But what you do need to be doing is asking yourself, which of these categories do you fall into? Which of these is kind of your pulse? Do you chase after wisdom? Are you self-inclined to pleasure? Are you self-inclined to be working and saving up? And what Solomon does is he really shows what happens when we chase after these things in and of themselves. So the first section will be wisdom. And the point is there's never enough wisdom in the world to satisfy you. Look in verses 12 through uh, 14 here. Let me just go ahead and read that. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. So something interesting for you uh, Bible people out there. Solomon was known as the wisest man, the wisest person in the world at this time. And Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes, is part of what's called the wisdom literature. 
So it's just really interesting that he's saying, I applied my heart to seek and search out uh, by wisdom all that's done under heaven. And he finds out that everything done under heaven is an unhappy business. He's seen everything that's done under the sun, and behold, it's all vanity, striving after the wind. But we have to look and see what kind of wisdom he was chasing after. Again, in verse 13, he says he wanted to seek out by wisdom all that's done under heaven. So he was seeking out, trying to understand how this world works. How does this world work? What's the point of it? What's kind of going on in this world? Uh, what's happening in it? He probably was trying to understand different economies, um, how agriculture works, academic work, you name it. He sought to understand it if it means that he could try to understand how the world works. And maybe that's kind of how you are. Maybe you just love to uh, research different things, love to look up and try to understand a new topic that comes your way. Um, I have to admit that's kind of my heart. Um, if there's something new that I've heard about, I'm the first one to try to research, look up different things. Um, that's how my dad was. He tried to learn a whole bunch of things, um, whether it was work-related or uh, just knowledge-related. There was a time where um, he tried transcendental, uh, transcendentalism, basically this really weird meditation, trying to be one with the world. He saw it to be a jack of all trades. So if this is kind of your inclination to try to understand how the world works, we have to see that Solomon came to one conclusion and that it is not pleasant when you understand how the world works. And all you have to do is just press and see things to their finished point. Um, if you study history, you'll read about the rise and fall of many nations. Uh, you'll see about the rise and fall of the Mongol Empire, the rise and fall of uh, Greece, of Rome, the heyday of the British Empire. Um, and you'll come to the conclusion that given enough time, the United States will most likely go in that same way or fall into obscurity. All you have to do is read about the different cities and nations that are mentioned in the Bible that are no longer here. They're either a completely different nation or they simply don't exist anymore. Um, you never hear about the modern city of Babylon. You never hear about Asia Minor. We know that it's Turkey. But when you push everything to its point in history, you'll realize that this nation will fall into obscurity or completely dissolve given enough time. If you want to look at what's happening right now with this epidemic, right? Trying to understand all the wise decisions to make, whether we need to open up schools or open up church or not open up schools or do this hybrid system, you'll find out that this is not a new thing. An epidemic is not new. Roughly 100 years ago, there was the pandemic of 1918, where it killed millions and millions of people. You've probably heard of the bubonic plague, where it wiped out a huge, huge percentage of Europe. Read in Exodus, and you'll find out that there were 10 plagues uh, that God used against the Egyptians. And with this realization, you'll know that in the future there will be another pandemic. And that generation will panic just like this generation is panicking over COVID. You'll come to the same conclusion as Solomon here that everything is meaningless. Trying to figure out a pandemic is going to be meaningless because it's going to happen again and again. Same thing with history. Nations rise and fall. If you want to go out even bigger and study about the universe, you'll realize that eventually, given enough time, what a lot of physicists are understanding is that the sun will increase in size and eventually swallow up this earth. If we happen to leave earth and go to a different planet, then you'll understand and find out that there will be an eventual 
heat death of the universe, which means that all the energy, everything in this universe will come to zero and nothing will exist. That is the wisdom that is found in the world. It's pointless. It's meaningless. Day in, day out, you do the same thing over and over and over again. You propagate, get another generation to come up, and at the very end, there's nothing. There's no point in everything going on. It truly is unhappy when you press wisdom and knowledge to its absolute end of the world. You'll question about the unstable jobs that happen, the orphans, the judicial corruption, blown tires, broken legs, sex trafficking, leaky faucets, failed adoptions, monthly bills, envy, project deadlines, rainy vacation, broken marriages, chronic back pain, pride, pornography, slippery roads, severed relationships, selfishness, racism, abortion, the list just goes on and on and on. And not only that, but remember, Solomon was the wisest person in his time. And in chapter 2, verses 4 through 16, he comes to another realization about wisdom. So chapter 2, verses 14 through 16 says, The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness, and yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I have said in my heart that this also is vanity. For the wise, uh, for of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days uh, to come all will have been long forgotten. Solomon comes to the conclusion that death happens to all of us. That if you're the wisest person you know, you will have the same fate as the most foolish person you know. You will come across death. You can't outsmart death. You can't be rich enough to surpass well, uh, death. You can't be wise enough to escape death. The most powerful men are all equals before death. And when Solomon came to this uh, realization, he said in verse 17 of chapter 2 that he hated life. And I don't blame him. If you come to that conclusion that this whole world is pointless, that nothing you do really matters, that the wisest thing that you can come to the conclusion of is that you'll be forgotten, yeah, I would, I would start to hate life too. In fact, there's a thing called nihilism, which basically says life is meaningless and the smartest thing to do is just to not exist. This is the conclusion that Solomon came to. That's what wisdom showed Solomon. We all face death and this world isn't pleasant. That was, this is our world, this was Solomon's world. And when facing this realization, he did what a lot of us do when faced with harsh realities or faced with painful uh, realizations. He turned to enjoying the world for everything it had to offer. So that's the next point. There's never enough pleasure to satisfy you. So if life has no meaning and everything is pointless, Solomon turned to pleasure, to let it numb him and distract him from this reality. Look with me in chapter 2, starting in verse 3. He just lists off everything he is chasing after, or really in verse 1. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure, enjoy yourself. But behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it's mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched in my heart how to cheer my body with wine, so he's going with wine in verse 4. He built houses. He planted a vineyard in verse 5. He made gardens, parks, all kinds of fruit trees. In verse 7, he, made, uh, he had many servants. 
He had herds of livestock. In verse 8, he had piles of silver and of gold, treasure from all other kings and lands, his own personal concert of sorts. He had so many different singers. He had many, many, many wives and many, many, many concubines. So whatever Solomon wanted, he did not stop himself. He did not deny himself of that. And again, this did not satisfy him. And there may be many of you that are trying this right now. And if not you, you know someone who does. You know someone who's trying to turn to alcohol to solve their problems. You know someone that used to love to party, and once they grew out of that, they still drink like they used to. They tried to numb themselves. There are many that deal with drug addictions because they started out trying to chase a high, trying to feel good, and now they use it to numb themselves of the world. Many of you want to get a new car or a new truck or a new boat or whatever, a new rifle. You want to indulge yourself. You want to numb yourself. You know someone who may want to numb themselves from the pain. There are some of us that like to go on trips, go on a lot of different vacations to enjoy the scenery, enjoy the world, to distract um, themselves from the present reality that your job may not be going well, that you may be having family issues at home. We chase after whatever can distract us, whatever can numb us, so we don't have to think about how this world is. A lot of times that's how adultery starts. Something's not going right in marriage, and we start to fantasize about someone else that can solve our problems. We start to fantasize and dream about someone who can either provide us enough pleasure or someone who can give us pleasure and comfort. It starts out small and it just grows as we chase after pleasure here. It's the same thing with so many different addictions. Our hearts will always crave more and more and more that nothing we chase after will satisfy us. Our hearts crave perfection. That's what our hearts crave. They crave perfection, and nothing in this world is perfect. There's no perfect pleasure to uh, absolutely satisfy you. Your heart will just crave more and more and more because it wants something that is perfect. And everyone who has gone down this path of pleasure, trying to find its end, will realize that it's endless and that will lead to brokenness. This is something I struggle with early on in my walk and before I was saved. I was trying to pursue a lot of different drugs. I was trying to pursue just all sorts of different things. And at the end of it, I just was so broken. It had just become dull. My whole life was basically, all I can describe of it was just being gray. The colors were not vibrant. The sounds, music was dull. My heart was just broken and numb because I was trying to medicate myself with all these different pleasures. That everything you do, everything you work for, everything that you try to chase after in the world, in and of itself, will not satisfy you. And then... In our next point, there are those of you who want to work or want to save up and want to do these different things to stay busy and save as much as you can. And that's our third point. There's never enough work in savings to satisfy you. So the last category in this section that Solomon sees as meaningless is work and saving up riches. Look with me in chapter 2. Uh, verse 22 and it says what has a man 
from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun. For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. So Solomon here was going after work, and he realized that everything he was working for, everything he was saving up for, he cannot take with him in the grave. That someone would inherit his savings. Someone would take over what he had worked so hard for. And that the work in and of itself just vexes him. Um, I remember teaching a Bible study one time uh, at our apartment. And the Lord had actually provided the majority of the people there as being lost. They were just lost college students. So it's just a really interesting Bible study, trying to teach scripture or trying to walk life with uh, people who do not know Christ. And I remember asking them just a series of questions like, okay, why are you at college? And most of them was like, so I can get a degree, okay? How are you going to get a degree? Um, By making good grades. They wanted to make A's and wanted to make B's. And I asked them, okay, so you're wanting to make really good grades to get a degree. Why do you want a degree? So I can get a really good job. Why? So I can get a house. Why? So I can have a comfortable life. And just on and on, we were just asking questions, going back and forth. And they soon realized that in and of itself, all this work doesn't really have a whole lot of purpose. That you study you get a degree, you get a job, you get a house, you have children, so that when you pass on, your children may waste your wealth, waste your property, waste your house, and within a couple generations, all the work you put forward was for no reason. You were forgotten. And maybe that's you today, that you're just wondering why you're saving up for retirement that it may get all wasted away anyway you may be looking at your savings or you may be looking at all your possessions that you worked so hard for and you may come across the realization why do i have all of these different things why am i just enjoying these different things when they may get sold once i'm gone A couple years ago, I was cleaning out a storage shed at BCM at the Baptist Collegiate Ministry, trying to make room for a lot of different decorations and what have you. And I came across this box that was just filled to the brim of trophies. These trophies from intramural football, basketball, all these different things. I mean, all these trophies, like first place, second place, Um, champions from like the 70s and 80s and it just got me thinking about all the work that these students put into to get a trophy that's now sitting in a storage shed and eventually got taken to a dumpster like all of this work all of your achievements that you work so hard for other people down the line will not care about them in the way that you or your immediately immediate family cared for them so why do we do these things why do we seek out pleasure to its fullest why do we seek out wisdom why do we work and work and work and save up all these different things what is driving us and the answer to that is back in chapter 1 verse 15 Chapter 1, verse 15 says, What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. This is what we try to do. We try to make straight what is crooked. And for y'all to kind of understand what that means is this is kind of an analogy for sin. Sin in our lives, sin of the world, that through Adam and Eve, sinning against God, the whole world was subjected to futility, that sin was introduced, death was introduced, work became hard, that everything was not right. It was crooked. Sin literally means missing the mark. 
So this is what we try to do. We try to work and try to have pleasure and try to build up knowledge so that we think we can try to make straight what is crooked. And Solomon plainly says, what is crooked cannot be made straight. It cannot be made straight. Nothing that you and I do will ever truly make this world a perfect place. In fact, when we rely on our own strength and our own knowledge and our own understanding, we often can make the world a worse place. Again, look back to Adam and Eve. They wanted to go with their own understanding and their own desire, and they brought in probably the worst thing that has ever happened to this planet. Even now, our growth of knowledge and wisdom, while it leads to a lot of different advancements, it brought on the possibility of a nuclear war. Our pursuit of pleasure to make things right end up destroying us physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Our pursuit of works and savings can ruin families in our health. Our pursuit of work in and of itself can take you away from your family. That all these different savings can tear people apart. So, I know I just spent the majority of this time just bashing down any of your hopes, any of your dreams for your passions. So how can this realization be a good thing? How can realizing most of everything that you do in and of itself is meaningless? I mean, the title of this sermon is called The Paradox of Meaninglessness, meaning there has to be some good form of meaninglessness. And the answer to that can be found in chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. Let me go ahead and read that. Chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat and who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and striving after the wind. This is the uplifting point right here. This is the key to how everything works. That we aren't called to find our fulfillment in uh, wisdom. We aren't called to find fulfillment in pleasure. We aren't called to find fulfillment in work alone. Rather, we should see that everything, understanding, wisdom, pleasure, work, all come from God as a gift from God. They're gifts from his hand. Every single thing that we do points to our creator. Just take a moment and think with me that God blesses our life that's full of toil, full of hardship, full of strife with enjoyment. It's good that we find joy in these different things because it comes from God. Every feeling of satisfaction, even in mundane life, such as making a bed or mopping a floor, organizing a closet is from the hand of God. The job you are at right now was gifted to you by God. The pleasures that you seek after, if they're according to scripture, are from God. The fact that you love to go deer hunting, God gave you that desire. The happiness in a deadline met, a budget balance, that is from God. I know it's supper time for a lot of you who are watching right now, so the pleasure from a really, really good, satisfying meal and the fact that um, once you get done and all the dishes are put up and you have that satisfaction of knowing that all that's behind you and you can look forward to rest, that is from God. 
the light of reading a book to your children or grandchildren, the blessing of just easing someone else's troubles, the fresh breeze when we look forward to fall, that is from God. All these different things point to God. Everything that you can enjoy in can find their full satisfaction in God. And once we put our satisfaction in God alone, then we can fully appreciate all these little moments that everything right here has a purpose, whether it's having lunch with friends or having a quick conversation with someone, that does have a meaning in God. That all of our knowledge, all of our works can find their full meaning in God, but apart from him, it's meaningless. We have to understand that God blesses us with these gifts so that we can look and see the giver of those gifts. And finally, look with me in verse 26. I'm going to read it one more time. For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God. So the question we really have to be asking is, okay, God will give wisdom and knowledge and joy to uh, the one who pleases him. So a really good question to ask is, okay, how, how do I go about this? How do I go about getting this joy, getting this knowledge, giving this wisdom? And our temptation is to look and try to do more good stuff. Our temptation is try to be moral. It's like, okay, if I just go to church enough, if I just read my Bible enough, if I just pray enough, if I do all these good deeds, then obviously God's going to bless me with all these different things. We rarely try to see ourselves in the second category, right? We don't want to see ourselves as the sinner, which God has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. But... We all are in this category. We all are sinners. We all at one point was against God. We all have been given this task of collecting and gathering. So who is the one who pleases God? The only one that can please God is by perfectly doing and fulfilling his commandments. The only one that truly pleases God is his son, Jesus Christ. That is the only one. Jesus was the only one to perfectly obey God, to perfectly um, follow his commandments, to perfectly love. In fact, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, it says, and behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Jesus is the one that pleases God perfectly. But, and this is the beauty of the gospel, when we trust in him, God no longer sees our sin, but he sees that we're in union with his Son, with whom he is well pleased. And not only that, but every knee will bow before Jesus. Every knee will bow. This is the answer to this question here. of uh, uh, The business of gathering and collecting only get to give to the one who pleases G uh, God. So at some point, every knee will bow. Every knee, every person will realize that uh, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And those of us who follow Jesus, that trust in him, we have God's pleasure. We share in that. We share in this wisdom and knowledge and joy that comes from God. So what I just want you to do is just take the moment and appreciate all the little things that God has given you. That in and of themselves, it is meaningless, but... Through Jesus, life has a purpose. Through Jesus, everything points to God, and we can use those opportunities to share the good news with other people. 
we can see the meaningless of, not, of life in and of itself and rejoice because this life points us to the creator and sustainer of it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for just the fact that life does have purpose uh, when we follow your son. That in and of itself, life does look meaningless. That when you pursue everything to its extreme, that it just results in brokenness and heartache. But we can rejoice and know that your son made a way for us to come to you. That one day, everything will be restored. That we will be with um, you. That we will be on a new earth that's devoid of sin. That we'll live in uh, perfection with you, worshiping you. That in this life right here, we can use it as an opportunity to share with others who may feel broken, who may feel lost, who may feel that life doesn't have a meaning. And we can say there is a meaning and it is to worship you. That we can share the gospel of your son with them. So I pray you burden our hearts with this. That we can take time to appreciate everything going on in our life and to use that as a gospel opportunity. And I pray this in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen. Our closing hymn is There's Something About That Name, Miss Ellen. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Thank you for all of you who uh, tuned in. I hope that uh, this message was encouraging despite it being in Ecclesiastes. I pray that um, you just have the, a good rest of the day. So as we go, let me go ahead and close this out in prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for just this day of rest where we can worship you, where we can reflect on it's all the many blessings that you've given us. I pray that as we go, that we can seek after your son, that we can have purpose in everything we do, that uh, we can use opportunities to share the good news about your son. And we pray this in your son's precious and all-powerful name. Amen. <laughs>